We're glad to know that you're still there and uh, watching us uh, on breakfast on Fast TV Africa. We are being joined by Mr. Jide Johnson, a chief lecturer in the Nigerian Institute of Journalism here in Lagos, to be looking at the headlines that made it to the front pages of some of our national dailies. Good morning and welcome to the program, Mr. Johnson. Good morning. Good, mo good morning and good morning to our viewers on the world. Okay. Uh, well, so we have like four papers and we hope that we are going to be able to cover uh, the major headlines on these papers. We're beginning with the Punch newspaper this morning. Um, the leading headline there is NNPCL marketers disagree over supply as queues spread. We'll just be taking your brief comments on all of this. Let's begin with that. Well, um, the true nature of the supply and demand chain of government and government sector is not really clear to anybody. There seems to be a lot of cloud surrounding it. Any slight increase in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the exchange rate of dollar to dollar automatically affects uh, the supply chain. Or any slight disruption within the global international oil market automatically affects the, the supply chain and before you know it the queue begins to emerge it's not something which is just happening it has been a recurrent feature and then we then ask this question don't we have a dump site where we keep um some reserves does it mean that it's on daily basis that we make we import petroleum product, products, and then we consume the one we import daily. And there is no strategic reserve in, in case of any natural disaster, war, or what have you, so as to prevent us from being dependent on other nations. So that's why you are seeing this disagreement between the NNPC and oil market. As the NNPC we make assurances that, um, or we give assurances that, okay, we have reserves that will last for the next one for the next one month. And before you see Jack Robinson, the oil marketers will quickly change the pump prices of their petroleum products once there is a major dislocation or a minor dislocation, or once there is an it once there is a difference in the exchange rate of the naira to the dollar. It shows that in that particular sector needs reform. There should be a major transparency with what goes on with that particular sector. And some of us have thought that the president will have done a clean sweep of the NNPC, just like what he did with the central bank and other agencies of the federal government. But it seems that the NNPC management team is protected from, from investigation. In my own in my own estimation, in my own opinion, I might be wrong, because this topsy turvy approach to the way this sector is managed is not doing the country any good because we don't even have a clear figure of the amount of crude oil we, we, we pump on a daily basis. Nobody has an accurate figure of the amount of refined products we import into Nigeria on a daily basis. Nobody has a clear cut figure on the amount of petroleum products we consume on a daily basis in Nigeria. Everything is shrouded in secrecy. At a situation whereby you don't have an accurate figure, you can't plan. It's sad. Yeah, well, but that ministry seems to be uh, superintended, over, uh, superintended over by the president himself. And I don't know how he intends to do that, why he's shielding these people from, from uh, investigation. Uh, but. Another headline up there is um, INEC defends 2023 polls, says 712 uh, petitions dismissed. Remember that two days ago, I think, there were reports of the fact that the credibility of INEC has dropped drastically as 94% of um, positions that were contested for are now being contested in the courts. In fact, out of uh, 1,000 and 28 or so, 1,002 are being contested. Or if, uh, maybe I, I didn't get that figure very right, but 94%, that one I'm sure about, 
uh, being contested. Now, INEC is saying they did a good job because 712 cases have been dismissed. What are your thoughts on that? On technical terms, not on element of the of the, the fact that you have 94 litigation with respect to the conduct of the election and the body that is well funded, well funded given all the resources in the past, and by doing that give assurance to Nigeria that we can have confidence and trust in the future, only for them to find out that the body did not discharge the responsibility that was given to it, and there was no justification for the resources invested in, in, in that body to, to provide Nigeria with a credible, credible election, then yeah, they are giving themselves past that shows that only six percent of their conduct was kind of agreeable to by both by parties that are involved in the election. You see, it's not that in Nigeria we don't hold people accountable. And I'll say it, and I'll say it. Um it's in Nigeria that we reward incompetence. That's just, that's just my thing. Uh, for example, you recall the INEC Commissioner for Washington State in 2018 that um, to, to pretend that election was rewarded with the commissionership of Lagos. And during the elections in Lagos, you recall how police units were taken out of BGC and they were placed on the road. Mm. Uh, and you monitor the election, you saw what happened in the election, the violence that characterized the election, you saw how there was no compliance with the electoral with the electoral act. We saw how there was no compliance with the guideline of the election by INEC, and INEC is calling itself fast back, saying that because the judiciary has thrown away many of the cases on technical grounds, and because of that they are shouting the weaker. Well, there is, the, there, is the, there is the judicial system. You can win the cases in the court of law. But in the court of public opinion, that's what really matters. And that's what you have seen with public perception of what INEC is. And at the end of the process, we will see what will be the public perception of the judiciary as an institution of instituting democratic values and democratic governance in Nigeria. So we'll let's wait for the end of all the cases, and then we we'll look at what we want to say concerning the judiciary. The judiciary itself is already facing its own test case, because until now, there was no campaign in Nigeria, to my knowledge and to my understanding, whereby you have a public campaign creating the consciousness on all eyes on the judiciary. Okay, we have this story uh, down there on that same uh, Punch newspaper. Um, Okada riders shown government's ban return to restricted areas in Lagos State. Uh, what are we not seeing? They have been banned, now they are back. And silently and gradually they will flood our streets uh, again. What do you think about what is happening? Well, well the, the, the state of the roads in Lagos the state of the road in Lagos is only suited for Canada, not for Canada. That's, that's, that's the basic truth. Now, you, it, 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 it's clear. Just tell me the roads that are good in Lagos. All the roads have completely collapsed. And then the government will find it worthy to collect roadworthiness from me and from you, from other car owners, in, in Lagos, roadworthiness. Are the roads worthy of our car? Are they worthy of our car? Now, another thing that is also being done in Lagos is the is this um, proof of ownership that on yearly basis you'll be renewing your, your proof of ownership. We we make more money yet we have nothing to show for it in terms of basic infrastructure. Just look at the basic <laughs> the 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 rainfall in the last one month 
has completely exposed the deficiency in the construction of roads in Lagos and the utter neglect with respect to maintenance of roads. So why will Okada not return? I knew how much I spent in my time just running into 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 a ditch and not a foot hole or on the roads. You don't have foot holes again. You now have ditches and greaters. So why will Okada not return? I would rather enter Okada than for me to drive on some certain part of part of Lagos than to end up spending extra money repairing my car. Where is it going to come from? It's serious. So, which means it's a it's a problem of the 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 government not doing the need. The government created the problem. The transportation costs have increased. Uh, um, cost of maintaining cars have increased, and the government promised to to release public buses to ease the. But where are the public buses? Even if you look at even if you look at the BRT corridor. The BRT corridor, the, the BRT corridor, <coughs> they even have potholes and, and graters. That's why the fact that government created that corridor for, for, for public transport and then they make money they make money from it and they don't even allow commuters to pass through those corridors. That's why the fact that we are here. Okay. I I lost your audio. I wasn't hearing you anymore. So I was wondering okay. what happened. But I can oh, now yeah. hear you. Now let's let's move to the Guardian newspaper. And uh, we're not taking the leading headlines there, uh, which is uh, Varsity's sad tales of underfunded, understaffed medical centers. We're beginning with um, NSAS. Activists lament non-implementation of pro-panel recommendations. Well, if you, do, if you, someone said, if you don't want to get a job done, set up a committee. And if you don't want to get to the root of any matter, set up a panel. And um, you know how many panels we have had in this country that we don't actually get the outcome of the panel. It's very, it's very, very simple and it's very, very clear. As far as um, that particular issue is concerned, they've glossed over that. They've glossed over that issue. Let me give you one panel that was set up. You recall the panel of that INEC chairman, INEC resident electoral commissioner, rather, that declared the result in Adamera State single-handedly without getting the result. What has happened to the panel that was set up in the hmm. So, as far as the issue of panel is concerned, you have different types of panel, and then once you set up the panel, it's just to take the public eye of the problem and after a while government will gloss over it and then there's nothing for us to think about it. Three years after, nothing has been done with respect to the entire school test. Hello, Mr. Johnson. I'm with you. Oh, okay. Uh, I thought it was your audio that I lost. Okay, so NSAS um, uh, panel recommendations have not been implemented. Well, let's move. Can, 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 we, can we get justice concerning that matter? That something of that magnitude happened in Nigeria and then there's no consequences or no punishment or no sanction for those that were found culpable of wasting the lives of of young Nigerians. Uh, have they still accepted that the lives of Nigerians were wasted? Even though we have now seen that the government said they were going to bury uh, these corpses that hitherto never existed with a huge sum of money, uh, but we haven't heard a categorical statement saying that, okay, truly these people died. Because even these ones that they said they were going to bury, they said uh, they were from every other place apart from uh, for instance, the um, toll gate uh, that uh, a lot of people said these things happened. So I, I don't know how, how we can trust the government it's, that they are doing see, saying the, the right thing. If you see the political outreach of Nigerians, 
over what happened in other times, in other countries, mm. when something of that nature happened in other countries, and you compare it to the attitude you have in Nigeria, when some things happen at home, then you have a clear understanding of what type of value you place in the lives of an average Nigerian. What is the value the Nigerian place in, in, the, in the life of a Nigerian? What type of value do we place the, the government play in, in the life of an average Nigerian. Nigerians are much more concerned about what is happening in Gaza, what is happening in Israel, than they will be because even government as well, and even critical stakeholders like religious leaders and traditional rulers, that what is happening in South Africa, that what is happening in Grandfather State, or what is happening in Venue or Nasarawa, where we have this issues of farmer either clashes or where we have this ethnic cleansing happening. And then we are much more concerned about what happened in thousands of kilometers far away from home. It's unfortunate. The, the bottom line is what value do we place in the life of a Nigerian? You think the value of, of the life of a foreigner is much more important to a Nigerian and is more, much more of concern to our government officials and critical stakeholders like traditional rulers and religious leaders in Nigeria. Okay, the president, um, President uh, Tinobu, has appointed very many young people into this cabinet. One of them is the former boss who uh, is said to be 24 years. We've seen him appoint someone who is still serving into the accounts committee. We've seen him appoint ministers that are still under 40 and all that. But I don't know whether it should give me worry or I should be happy about it, that he has removed, or according to how the headline is, Tinubu revokes Imam's uh, nomination as former chairman, appoints CEO for parastatals. Now, there was public outcry that he shouldn't have appointed this person into that position, maybe because he was, he was too young or whatever was the reason that people gave this outcry. And then he revokes it because people said, I don't know if I will say, I will clap for him that he listens to the people or I will be sad that he cannot take a decision and be firm uh, in his decision knowing that the person he appointed is competent enough. You know, the guy, the guy was, 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 you know what, on that worry that um, anything that is done on the house of will be assumed to be listening. Mm -hmm. If you recall, you know, the, the only skill, you need know, a lot of appointments of dead people. You find a lot of dead people in, 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 in being appointed in two offices. You can contact, this is nothing but number. I think that you must have one spectrum of people that cross across all the strata from young to old to the elderly. That, that's the beauty of, of having a robust um, public, public service. I saw nothing wrong um, with the 24 year old being appointed. Mm. If he is qualified for that job, yeah. after all, Obama became president at the age of, at what age? I think at, 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 at that we something where the bus job goes. And I think one was in the late 20s when, so as far as I'm concerned, it is nothing but number. The critical component and the critical element is the person qualified for the position. If the person is qualified for the position, no problem. That's, that's, that after all, <coughs> you can vote from 18. And be voted for. But however, we place some certain restrictions that you cannot seek elective offices until you are starting age. But there was nothing wrong with a 24 year old being appointed into the board if he's qualified, if he's experienced enough, if he has the capacity. It should be the least thing we should consider. It is the capacity and the competence of the person we should take into consideration. That's that's right. And then if the president is not responding to public opinion because people criticize, question that guy on the basis of his age, then that means that those that are making the selection for the president are not doing what they are supposed to do. 
what is the quality of work that is put in in the selection process of people that are appointed into office? I think they need to put their eyes on that. But as far as I'm concerned, I see nothing wrong with appointing a 24-year-old to hold, to, hold, um, to hold an agency, to hold an agency of government. There's yeah. nothing wrong with it. If, it. if it's qualified and if it's competent. Okay. Uh, because a case like this happened as well in Cross River State. Someone was uh, nom nominated to become one of the commissioners in the, in the NDDC, and there was public outcry that he was not APC, so he shouldn't occupy that position. And the very next week, after the, the person was jubilating, the appointment was revoked. So that's why I kept asking myself. And this one, one was not a young person. He was a very competent, very uh, grounded politician. But it was revoked on the basis that he was not the APC. Last, in, the last, in the last presidential election, APC had less than 9 million votes. In actual sense, we had, I think, about 34% of the entire vote. <laughs> the elections have ended. Now it's about administration. Are they going to collect taxes from APC members alone? Or are they collecting taxes from APC members alone? It is the federal government of Nigeria. It is not the federal government of APC. We must, we must, we must state this clearly. And the president must and should look for Nigerians, regardless of their party affiliation, that are competent, capable, and qualified to move this nation out of the doorblocks. It is not a pity that has put us where we are. Mm. And so if you have people that are qualified, that are better equipped to help this nation moving forward, whether they are APC member or not APC member, the president should appoint them. Mm. I agree with you totally. Now, uh, as we face the um, transportation problems in Nigeria, the new directive is that uh, uh, if you are a startup airline, you should have six. So operators fault new six aircraft fleet rule for startup airlines. I don't know what you you would make of that. Six for startups. Well, um, probably well, you still use, I don't know whether uh, uh, the aviation minister mm. in person of Professor Kiyamu, SAN, I hope he learns from the mistakes of um, Adisirika. And then they must also understand that there is a need for us to have a lot of players in that particular sector mm. and not to create, create policies that will stop people from, that are interested in investing in that sector, to invest in that particular sector. The number of airlines we have, operators I mean, and the number of routes they travel in Nigeria, it's still minimal. And then we still need some small, small players that could travel. Okay, let me say, for example, um, Lagos to Ibadan. No, those, and then some will just pick some certain areas in which they will just use as their own core competence. I think they need to have a rethink. If somebody wants to start by flying to Ibadan and say, I want to fly to Ibadan alone, and he has two aircraft, let him, let him operate, but ensure that he complies with all the safety. It is not about the number of airlines you have. It's about the safety regulations. The focus should be on the safety regulations and not on the number. If you have if you have 30 air, aircraft and then you don't comply with the safety regulations, you are just putting the lives of people in danger. So they should allow players to come in, those that want to <coughs> have a new team market, operate within within a limited zone and then just ensure that they comply with the safety requirements. Mm. Okay, so um, we move to the nation newspaper, and one of the headlines there is federal government and states to join forces in mining. I do not understand much about what this mining is about. I'm sure um, crude oil is a product that is being mined. Gold in the north is a product that is being mined. Uh, are they talking about the fact that they are going to 
uh, return to the state and see how they can join forces to talk about uh, crude oil mining and then other things, mineral resources that are being mined in Nigeria? Or are they going to do that when it comes to gold and other mineral resources and leave crude oil only for the federal government as it is right now? Yeah, you know, uh, oil is concentrated in, some, in certain section of the country mm. compared to other solid minerals that are scattered all over the length and breadth of Nigeria. And I'm sure that the federal government does not have the resources. You know, once you go to the Niger Delta, you put the Niger Delta, you have a corridor concerning the Niger Delta system. You could monitor the exploration of oil, which is mining actually, like you said, in simple terms. Even with that, we still have oil theft in that particular, mm. in that particular, in that particular sector, in that particular area. Now, not to talk about knowledge. The federal government does not have the resources to monitor. How would they monitor the mining of gold in Zafara? Or they come to Elisha and effect in Oshun State, and then the ones in Nasarawa State. I think Nasarawa State seems to have to be the state with the largest uh, reserve of of solid minerals in Nigeria. And then they go to <coughs> they go to Bonusu. I think using a joint vector with measure of transparency is what can be done. If you are expecting federal government to single-handedly monitor it, I can assure you they don't have the resources. And presently, a lot of these resources are being mined. To my knowledge, I might be, I might be wrong, um, are being mined illegally yeah. <laughs> by, by, by foreign nationals. I don't want to pigment a particular nation for committing what I call economic crime against Nigeria. But if you, if you, if you, are, if you are an avid follower of issues in the media, you will know that a certain national from one of the major powers in the world uh, uh, illegally mine our natural resources. So we need exploiting the state we connivance of some certain elements without the government at the federal level making money out of it. So I think that the, gov the federal government and the state government needs to work together as a team. Yeah, so but, but will that be fair? Will it, can generate we know that um, the, the bush rat cannot come into the house if the house rat doesn't lead, it, lead the way. <laughs> so we know there are people yeah. who are conniving with them. But will it be fair uh, to say that okay when it comes to gold and other mineral resources the states will collaborate and then possibly share their assets and all that and then when it comes to crude oil the federal government takes charge because they can see where these things are and they they they, they take charge of, of 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 mining it so will it will that be fair to the states that their own mineral resources are the oil that be is being is the oil that is being drilled from their land you know the unfortunate thing about Nigeria? The progressive element came together in 2013 and joined forces with other progressive elements in the north and a tinge of the conservative element. And that progressive structure took over the reins of power in 2015. You'll have thought that all the progressive ideologies that have been propagated in Nigeria, will have, like local government autonomy, resource control, um, uh, devolutions of devolutions, devolution of power, and strengthening other institutions. But what we see in the last eight years, under the progressive quote unquote umbrella in Nigeria. It's more concentration of power at the center than having devolutions of power at the state and local government level. You see this conversation concerning resource control and concerning the regulation and devolution of power will still be an ongoing conversation. Because I agree with you, if federal government take 
100% control of oil exploration in the Niger Delta. Federal government should take 100% control of the mining of solid minerals in Nigeria. Mm. Yeah. That, that's, that's, that's the bone of contention because it will be really unfair if they're removing it from whatever lease, exclusive lease or concurrent lease, whatever, where, wherever they're putting them, mining should be mining. So if the state and look, federal government are coming together to do it for any mineral resources, it should also be done for oil as well. well what I would advise the oil exploring states to do is to challenge the federal government, to take the federal government to court and challenge and um, secure a judgment. One, they should ask for two prayers. One, to be granted the reliefs that are given to states that have other solid mineral. Mm. Two, or uh, a two should be that um, whatever is being done in the Niger Delta should be extended to other 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 solid mineral state so it's a win-win situation mm. okay well mr jide johnson that's the much we can take from off the press this morning we'd like to thank you so much for being a part of our show today thank you very much it's a pleasure to be with you okay we've been talking with mr jide johnson chief lecturer at nigerian institute of journalism he spoke to us from here in lagos state we'll take a break and when we return we talk. Uh, we'll, we'll go over to our first hot topic. Stay with us.